Thanks for returning for our final session of um, Colonial Documents and the Air Indigenous Studies Collection. We're excited to present this final panel, which will be hosted by Laura Leon Lorena, coming to us from Durham in England, where it's a little bit later. Uh, and we're really grateful to her for being here. Uh, at this time, and I'm going to just turn it over to her. I'll just remind you that we'll take questions in the chat at any time. Uh, feel free to put them in full and we might call on you. And um, and also, we may not get to all the questions. We'll do our best, though. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. And thank you very much to you and to Sinead and to Analu for the kind invitation. Uh, that you made for me to participate in this symposium. I am very happy to be back at the Newberry, even if it's virtually. And I'm very happy to see all the colleagues that somehow are connected to the Newberry uh, attending the, the symposium as well. So um, as Lee explained, uh, in order to make it short, at least the introduction, and then just move on to the discussion of the documents and later to the q and I'm not going to introduce fully the, the presenters, but you can, you can find information, you can find their bios on the, on the chat box. Um, and as Leah said, uh, the, the chat will be open for questions and comments throughout the session. So please feel free to write down your questions there and um, write your questions in full to the speakers. And we will try to get to all of the questions uh, by the end of the presentations. So uh, let's start with Heather Allen, who will briefly talk about uh, the, the Browning manuscript. Heather, thank you. Thanks, Laura. I'm going to share my screen here. Whoops. OK, so um, today I'm talking about the Browning manuscript. Uh, Domingo Francisco de San Antonio Muñón Chimalpain Cuatlewanitzin, or simply Chimalpain, was from Amakemecanchalco, a region to the southeast of Mexico City. Um, in 1593, when he was 14 years old, he moved to Mexico City and managed the small church of San Anton Abad, which you can see the green arrow in the slide is pointing to. Uh, around 1605, he began to keep Nahuatl language annals using sources including Nahuatl pictorial and alphabetically written documents, interviews with elders, Spanish historical sources, and his own experiences. And then sometime between 1605 and 1631, he also transcribed La Conquista de México, a best-selling history by Spanish friar Francisco López de Gómara. In his transcription, he revised errors and amended historical information that he perceived to be inaccurate or incomplete. And his alterations include additions about Nahuatl history and culture, his perspective on the Spanish conquerors, and his linguistic and orthographic usage as a native speaker of Nahuatl. There are six extant versions of Chimalpine's transcription. None of them are in his hand. The earliest known and most complete copy is the Newberry Library's Browning Manuscript, which was made around 1743. And it was originally part of Italian antiquarian Lorenzo Bottudini Benaducci's collection, as are a lot of the documents that people have talked about today. Um, five individuals' handwriting appears in the document. The vast majority was made by the main scribe here. Um, who was uh, one of Botodini's copyists. Botodini's handwriting is the second most common. Scribe two made only two short comments. And then scribe three, who was also likely Botodini's employee, uh, was more prolific with about 12. And then the fifth and final hand belongs to Nicolas Leon, a Mexican scholar who penned an end note sometime between 1900 and 1929. Botudini and his scribes mistakenly believed that Chimalpine was the sole author of La Conquista, whereas Leon correctly understood that Chimalpine had transcribed part of Lopez de Gomorra's history. Now, when I first started working with the Browning manuscript, I believed that Chimalpine had written at least some marginalia in the holograph, which the scribes had then copied into the Browning manuscript. But I now believe that the scribes themselves offered the mar authored the marginalia, and their reactions to this polyvocal version of La Conquista can consequently help us track its reception and use over time. 
Today, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus just on Botodini and Scribe 3's marginalia, and then I'll quickly review the other scribes' contributions at the end. So Botodini came across Chimalpain's transcription of Lopez de Gomorra's La Conquista in the library of the Jesuit Colegio de San Pedro y San Pablo, while he was conducting research to write a history of pre-Hispanic Mexico and the Spanish invasion. He wanted to write a new history that supported the relatively common theory that Catholic saints had appeared in the Americas and introduced Christian beliefs before the Spaniards had arrived. And he also wanted to write a history that centered Nahua participants rather than present rather than present Cortez as a hero, which was a common complaint that a lot of historians had about Lopez de Gomara, that Cortez was too much of a hero. So Botodini's marginalia in the Browning manuscript reflects these historic historiographical goals. For instance, in a chapter about the religious practices of the Maya living on the island of Acusamil, Lopez de Gomara states that there are no signs on the island or in any part of the Indies that anyone had attempted to evangelize before the Spaniards had arrived. But Botodini contradicts this in a marginal note. And I have the Spanish and English here for you on the slide. He says, Nota bene los hay, y predicó en estas Indias Santo Tomé Apóstol, dicen que San Bartolomé, aunque después no quedó quasi señas de él. So he's contradicting Lopez de Goma and saying that there were people um, preaching Catholicism. Regarding his emphasis on Nahua historical actors in the text to counterbalance, his, counterbalance Cortez's exaggerated heroism, six of Botodini's marginalia call attention to such figures. Most of these notes are next to places where Chimalpain added information, like full names, titles, genealogies, and political posts of Nawa rulers. So if we take these uh, together, Botodini's marginalia about a pre-Hispanic Catholic presence in Mesoamerica and Nawa nobles suggests that Chimalpain's changes to Lopez de Gomara's conquista influenced Botodini's readings of the text, even if he didn't realize the hybrid nature of what he was reading. So moving on to scribe three, he made about 12 marginal notes in the Browning manuscript. He probably worked for Botodini. And he seems to have copy edited the document because one of his marginal notes adds a phrase that was missing from Lopez de Gomara's original. And he wrote two marginalia noting an element relevant to Botodini's personal interests. He calls attention to an angel who's, who inspires Anawa to convert to Christianity which is an event that offered evidence that Christianity had arrived in the Americas before the Spaniards. As an individual, not as an employee of Botodini, he seems to have been well-read and knowledgeable about conquest histories, since he criticizes them for not sufficiently recounting the participation of Spaniards other than Cortez. He singles out Spanish soldiers for praise and notice and sympathy in juxtaposition to Chimalpain and Botodini's focus on Nahua figures. So this slide has an example of one of those um, notes. Um, and among Spaniards, he seems to have had a specific interest in Andalusians. Um, there are two notes where he comments on, on, on Andalusian soldiers. Um, this slide gives an example of one of those. And I it could be because his family was from that region of Spain, or he had some other personal connection to it. So now I'll just run through a quick summary of the other scribes' contributions. Uh, the main scribe copied the majority of the manuscript, and he also, his handwriting is visible in other items from Botodini's collection. Uh, because he made only one marginal note, he seems to have operated strictly as a professional copyist, transferring text from the holograph into this one as accurately as he could. Scribe two has less practiced handwriting and he just made two marginal notes, which suggests a slightly later reader who was not empl employed by Botodini. And because his notes appear in chapters describing native rulers, it might be that he had a particular interest in their customs and habits and hoped to gain insight from a text ostensibly by a Nawa author, or he could have been influenced by Chimalpine's added emphasis on Nawa participation in the conquest. And then finally, Nicolas Leon, was the last to annotate the Browning manuscript about 160 years later, so early 1900s. Leon was a professor and the director of physical anthropology at the National Museum of Archaeology, Ethnography, and History, and he published extensively. Unlike the other scribes, he understood that Chimalpain had 
transcribed Lopez de Gomez La Conquista and not authored the history himself. But this didn't lessen the document in his eyes. In fact, his end note suggests that he considered publishing an updated edition as part of his efforts to preserve the pre-Hispanic past. So in sum, the marginalia in the Browning manuscript indicate that scribal readers continue to value Chimalpine's historical perspective regardless of their understanding of how it was mediated. And they intended to put this knowledge to diverse uses. So Boturini and his copyists in particular sought to it sought information to support Boturini's historiographical project. And then Leon considered bringing Chimal Pine's voice, even though it was mediated through his transcription of Lopez de Gomera to a broader reading public. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Heather. That was really fascinating. Um, and now to turn uh, for Amber Bryan to talk about the Relación Sucinta en Forma de Memorial. Amber, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Uh, thank you all for for sticking around for this this last panel of what's been such a, a wonderful and stimulating symposium. Um, as as others have mentioned, I'd also like to note my gratitude to Leah and the staff at the Newberry uh, for hosting this event. And it's it's really a tremendous honor to be part of this conversation. Uh, the roundtable yesterday and the wonderful presentations um, by Sané Valian, Jean O'Brien, and Analu Lopez poignantly spoke to the past, present, and future of this collection. Inevitably, uh, thinking about the air collection and the materials it houses, we're faced with contemplating the legacies of colonialism, both the violence of dispossession and the reality of survival survival of people's languages, knowledge, stories, and materials. The talks yesterday also reminded me that relationships are key to making sense of the collection and its holdings. Air is infatuation with Prescott, albeit in book form, uh, his connections with collectors and booksellers, John Aubrey uh, as the expedition's guide for decades, as Professor O'Brien pointed out, and the current emphasis under Analu Lopez's guidance uh, on relationship building with indigenous communities, scholars, and young scholars in training. I'd like to share with you an item from the Air Collection that points to some of the ways in which connections and relationships are part of the history of the documents as well. And this will be echoing um, much of, of what we've been hearing in other presentations today. Boturini <laughs> will, will come up. Um, as part of my study of the 17th century mestizo historian, Don Fernando de Alba y Sotil, I worked with 18th century manuscript copies of historical works that are part of the air collection. As Ruth Lapham Butler described in her 1937 inventory, there are three Alba y Sotil texts in the collection cataloged as air 1108, 1109, and 1110. Each represents a manuscript copy or copy of a copy of the original manuscript text. Alba Isi Sotil was a descendant of Nahuatl rulers of the central Mexican Altepet of Texcoco. He was an assiduous collector of indigenous pictorial and alphabetic texts and a prolific chronicler of Mexican history before and after. 1519. Alba Isisotl's five historical narratives, including his magnum opus, uh, the Historia de la Nación Chichimeca, circulated widely in manuscript copies in the 18th century. His own works and his collection of pictorial and alphabetic texts were inherited by the Creole scholar Don Carlos de Siguenza y Gongora in the second half of the 17th century. His texts were first copied by Lorenzo Boturini, uh, whom we've, we've heard of um, today uh, from Cristina and then also just from Heather as well, uh, in the 18th century, and then uh, numerous other hands uh, through the beginning of the 19th century. Throughout his time, this time and beyond, Alba Isi Sotil's histories were influential for numerous historians, including Eris' beloved Prescott, Boturini indicated 
his copy was made directly from the originals, written in Alba Isi Sochal's own hand, and we can see here uh, noted um, toward the bottom of the page, De Puño de Don Fernando de Alba Isi Sochal. In 1827, these original manuscripts were given to the British and Foreign Bible Society and taken to England. From that time until the 1980s, the originals were lost to scholars and Alba Isi Sochal's works were known only through copies such as this one um, and others held, held um, at the New Newberry in the Air collection. Boturini's transcriptions of Alba Isi Sochal were used as the basis for later copies in published editions including Carlos Maria de Bustamante's 1829 edition of an account of the conquest published under the title Horribles Crueldades de los Conquistadores de, Me Mexico, de Mexico, um, Horrible Cruelties of the Con Conquistadors of Mexico. Boturini arrived, uh, as Christina shared with us earlier, in, uh, in Mexico, in Mexico City, arrived to Mexico City in 1735, 1736, and was forced out in 1743 after spending months in prison. His collection, which he called the Museo Historico Indiano, was confiscated before he left Spain and he spent the rest of his life unsuccessfully trying to retrieve it. The transcriptions of manuscripts by native authors in Boturini's own hand and the, the hands of copyists in his employ were instrumental in founding an archive of Mexican historical resources. And this, uh, again, Christina and Heather have have pointed out um, as well. In 1755, Mariano Fernandez de Echeverria y Betia made a copy of Alba y Cisachos Compendio Histórico de los Reyes de Texcoco based on Boturini's manuscript copy. This is also held at the Newberry Air 1108, um, which at that point was housed in the Vice Regal Office in Mexico City. Echeverria y Betia's copy registers a history of the text and its readers, including Carlos de Siguenza y Góngora, who had written a marginal note, uh, excuse me, who had writ written a marginal note on the original transcript, transcript that was later uh, copied by Votorini and Echeverria y Betia. Uh, here um, on the right, we can see the original um, manuscript by Alba Isi Sochal, I'll talk about that more in just a moment, uh, with Siguenza's um, hand at the top, and then at the, at the left, the um, copy by Echeverria y Betia. Uh, in that note, Siguenza wrote, um, and the 18th century historians also recorded, that Alba Isi Sochal should be read with caution, uh, because his excessive exaltation of his ancestor of the same name taints the truthfulness of the text. El autor de este convenio histórico de los reyes de Texcoco es Don Fernando de Alba y Cisotl, el cual se debe leer con grande cautela, pues por engrandecer su progenitor, Don Fernando Cortés y Cisotl, señor de Texcoco. Faltan muchas cosas, la verdad. As Alba y Cisotl's manuscripts were inherited by Siguenza and then copied by Boturini, Echevarria y Betia, and others, at each stage of their reproduction, they were given meaning in a specific historical and cultural context. The copies held in the air collection help us to think about those contexts in which the works were reread and reinterpreted, and where at times the reader Interpol interpolated his own marginal comments, uh, like the one we find here, where Boturini notes that a great deal of history is missing. Falta mucha historia. Critical comments, though, I'll note, like this, are rare um, in critical marginal comments in, um, in the Alba Isis, Alba Isis Social, um, in the copies of Alba Isis Social's um, texts. Um, more frequent are the notations nota bene, um, ojo, drawing attention to compelling information. Boturini, Echevarria y Betia, and other encyclopedic historians, such as Clavijero and Prescott, drew liberally from Alba y Social's writings. Uh, I'll, I'll end with a brief postscript on the original writings themselves. Um, and 
that might might be useful in meditating on the legacy of the copies that we find in the air collection. In 2014, the three volumes containing the three manuscript volumes containing Alvaisi Sochil's five autograph manuscripts were sold by the Bible Society to the Mexican government. And they're now housed in the Biblioteca Nacional de Antropología e Historia in Mexico City. After 150 years, these materials are back in Mexico and the volumes are now known as the Codice Chumapain after the Nahua historian discussed by Heather who authored uh, a text found in the third volume of these, these manuscripts. The manuscript copies held in the air collection point to the relationships and connections that facilitated the circulation of Alba Isi Suchitl's historical studies of indigenous Mexico before and after the arrival of Europeans. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, I'd just like to remind uh, those of us who have joined uh, recently that if you have any questions or comments, please write them down in the chat box and then we will um, proceed to read them after the presentations. And now is the turn for Abelardo de la Cruz, who will be introducing a novel comedic play from 1650s or 1740s. Abelardo, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone. Uh, first, I want to uh, to say thanks to uh, uh, Leah, uh, Rose Miron, and Ana Lu for the invitation uh, to this uh, presentation. Uh, well, I want to start with uh, an introduction in Nahuatl. Uh, that is my mother tongue. Piali no chime, nani ewa nechi con tepec veracruz, na ni masewali, wan no tlastol y toca na guatlastoli. Tlawel ni motlascamatilia, pampa ni knestis, kenzi tekit, tlenichiwa, wan tlamachtilistli, tlen no altepetsi. That was uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the, the Nahuatl that I speak. And of course, I feel grateful because I will show part of my work uh, uh, that I have done. Well, basically, I want to start with uh, uh, the manuscript that I worked. Uh, basically, I transcribe uh, the text uh, titled Se Ilamato Iwan Ishwiton. This is a a uh, play comedic uh, uh, that is in the uh, Ayer collection. Uh, the characters in this, uh, that participate in this uh, play are Ilama, uh, that is the grandmother, and Petol, uh, who is a uh, Pierrot. Well, basically this document is a Chandra, the Chandra is a drama or entre mes eh, in Spanish, in Nahuatl is Tehuetzkiti eh, Tepapachi, that is the, uh, the entre mes, uh, that it uh, is here uh, uh, in Nahuatl. Well, I learned uh, and I enjoyed a lot about this manuscript uh, that uh, I worked in the summer in 2019. Um, through the invitation to work uh, with this document by Analu. So this text was created and translated in Nahuatl in 17th century. Uh, so it's a short drama, uh, but of course I, I like it and uh, I transcribe. Well, I want to talk also about the Nahuatl documents and Nahuatl voices. Uh, as we know, Nahuatl documents are housed in the New Verde Library. Uh, also in the Ayer collection is housed the Lista de Material de Linguística uh, in the book titled, A Checklist of Manuscript. 
uh, created, I think, in 1937, that are texts and books written in Nahuatl. Uh, so it's, a, I think, a good book. Uh, and about that, uh, I am thinking, like, as a Nahuatl speaker, uh, Nahuatl documents and Nahuatl voices uh, represent a resource to do research. Um, is part of my work that I have done uh, for several years. Um, but also I am interested uh, to transmit this knowledge uh, to inhabitants, to my community. Uh, uh, and also uh, I am doing research about these uh, documents. Well, also, uh, I am a recipient of a research grant from the American Philosophical Society. At the APS, I will work on the Nahuatl recordings of Doña Luz Jimenez that uh, was recorded by Robert Barlow in 1949 in Milpa Alta, Ciudad de Mexico. Uh, I wanted to highlight this uh, uh, these parts, Nahua documents and Nahua voices, uh, because it's something that I have worked, right? The Nahua, book, the Nahua documents that were written in Nahuatl, but I like also the Nahua voices that are housed in uh, libraries, in museums here in the United States. And I think Ave uh, is good to will be good or is good to do research about that uh, using especially um, my mother tongue. Well, I want to talk now about Nahua people. Uh, from Chicontepec is a place where I was born. Uh, I want to present now the speakers, the, the Nahuas of today. Uh, in, in, this, in the first image, uh, we have the Sisters de la Cruz, uh, and they, are, they were celebrating the Ilhuititla, the Day of the Dead. Uh, and so uh, they, they are my family. Uh, uh, they, they speak just now, they don't speak uh, Spanish. And they are uh, Sisters de la Cruz, right? In that region, uh, many of my uh, colleagues, many Nahua peoples, we have this last name, right? De La Cruz. So many Nahuas with this last name are from Chicontepec, Veracruz. Also, uh, we have in the in this in, in this other picture, uh, Sir Cornelio and his wife. Uh, I took this picture uh, several uh, a couple years ago, right? And I titled this picture Il Tetatitsi Wan Shochitl. Right, the elderly and the flowers. Uh, so I maintain a connection with my community and they uh, taught me uh, Nahuatl. And now in my uh, time uh, in the United States, um, I use my mother tongue uh, firstly, and I do research uh, also, but uh, I maintain a strong connection with my community there in Chicontepec. Well, uh, now what of today in Chicontepec? Uh, to me, after reading the documents written by Nahuas in the colonial Mexico, uh, represents a connection with the knowledge inherited by my ancestors, right? Uh, to me, it's important to to read and, and to use the Nahuatl that I speak when I am reading a, a document, right? After reading the documents in Nahuatl, uh, to me is a way to know our history and the production of literature in my mother tongue. So many of these documents uh, written in Nahuatl and are in several archives or collections outside Mexico, mm, in our communities, we don't know about uh, these, these documents or this production, right? So to me, as a Nahua scholar, represents 
uh, the history of my ancestors and the production of literature. So through my work as an AWA scholar, it's a, it's a pleasure to collaborate in research projects related to Nahuatl documents. Um, I have had a, a training in um, to, to read these these documents. Right, is something uh, is not is unusual, right? Because uh, in my community, um, yes, we speak Nahuatl, but we cannot write in Nahuatl. We cannot read in Nahuatl, but when I am in my community, I try, or I am with the young people, and I say, hey, let's uh, uh, learn Nahuatl, uh, written Nahuatl, right? Or I share these ideas about these documents that are in Mexico or outside Mexico. So uh, my Nahuatl colleagues, uh, the Nahuatl scholars, and I want to give access to these documents and voices that are outside Mexico. Uh, and we want to give access or to transmit to Nahuatl people who are alive, who are in several Nahuatl communities in Mexico. We want to transmit to our Nahuatl brothers. So basically, Nahuatl documents that, that are outside or that are in the uh, Newberry or Nahuatl voices that are housed in several archives. To me, it's a resource to work, right? And at the same time, to share with my uh, community. So basically, uh, is that part that I want to share with you. Tlaskamatiniak. Thank you very much, Abelardo. That was, that was really fascinating and touching in the sense that, you know, you're basically explaining to us the ways in which indigenous languages that were colonized can be reappropriated in present times by their own speakers. So now we move on to the Q&A and um, please, I encourage you to write down your questions in the chat box and I'm going to try to read them as they come through. So first we have a question from Edward Polanco to actually to all panelists. Um, the question is, do any panelists know if Ixli Xochitl identified as native with Euro ancestry, Mestizo, or Euro with native ancestry? Um, others can give their perspectives as well. Um, I, thank you for the question, um, Edward. That's um, I, I, identity questions are always a little bit tricky. I, I, what I always try to say is that he very much identified with his native ancestors. He is what we would call Castizo. So three of his four grandparents uh, were European. Um, so he's he broadly is considered Mestizo, a Mestizo historian, but he was um, really more accurately Castizo. But he was very, very strongly identified with his native ancestors and with um, with their stories, with their with the figures that were part of his family family history, with their lands, um, and that was how he situated himself. Uh, Heather or Abelardo, would you like to add something? Amber is the Ishlu Shoshi expert in this panel. <laughs> Okay, so then let's move on to the next question, which is actually for you, Heather, uh, from Lisa Voigt. Um, she says, fascinating discussion of copyists in both, oops, sorry, in both Heather and Amber's presentations. Uh, for Heather, can you clarify what you mean about scribe three, adding something that was missing from Gomara? Does the scribe say that explicitly, and is that evidence that they thought they were reading Gomara directly? and not Chimal Bahin's transcription. And uh, more generally, could you talk about how your thinking evolved about the marginalia from being copied from Chimal Bahin to being the transcriber's interventions? Yeah, I knew that my description of scribe three was going to be a little bit confusing because I had to condense. Um, there is a published 
transcription of the Browning manuscript that uh, Susan Schrader and uh, Christian Roa and Tava David Tavares did, and they compared a 1552 version of Lopez de Gomorra's history with Chimo Pine's transcription and identified um, missing phrases. And so um, scribe three did fill in a missing phrase from the his from Lopez de Gomorra's history, but it's not clear whether he was just copying from Chimo Pine's holograph or whether he had the Lopez de Gomorra history and was comparing it. I think it's just that he was copy editing from Chimo Pine's document. Um, and that I think is what um, Schrader says in, in their book. Um, and then the other question, oh, why did I change my mind about the marginalia? Well, um, it seems that the, the main scribe, if there was marginalia, he would have just put it directly into the body of the text and not left it as a marginal comment. That's one of the reasons why. Um, and then the other is, why there's uh, what Boturini and then the three scribes that aren't Nicolas de Nicolas Leon um, seems strange that they would all have had access to the holograph and then copied uh, marginalia over from it also. Um, and so I think it was just like very wishful thinking that we could get some of Chimo Pine's marginalia. Um, but we have a lot of his his opinion in, in um, the actual body of the text and the corrections he made that, that Schrader and her colleagues identified. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, I have, there's a question here in Spanish. Uh, should I translate it or just read it in Spanish for Abelardo? Abelardo, prefieres que te la lea en español o? Or prefer que la lea in English? Uh, uh, well, in English is fine. <laughs> okay. So um, Edward Polanco is asking you um, if you could tell us a little more about the diversity in the Nahua world, especially since you are handling documents from various parts of Mexico. Uh, well, basically, uh, Edward, uh, I have met several Nahua people. Uh, in, in Guerrero or uh, in San Luis Potosí. And um, with this connection between uh, Nahua people, uh, uh, <laughs> like uh, I, I am able to talk and to understand uh, much more the several dialects that has the Nahuatl in Mexico because the Nahuatl that I speak is from Huasteca Veracruzana. <laughs> but the Nahuatl in Mexico has 30 dialects. So uh, according with my uh, work with uh, the documents, consulted dictionaries, I say that uh, I think that the Nahuatl is, what is the best expression, spread out uh, in Mexico. And so, so, so to me, to know that, that words that sometimes I do not use frequently in Huasteca, however, I can use I am able to use when I speak with other uh, people. And other interesting point <clears throat> is how is our, our identity? It might say, I say I am Masewali, I am, or I am an our person, but uh, uh, people from uh, Hidalgo, Mexico, they say, uh, I speak Mexcatl. Uh, I, 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 I am Nahua, but I speak Mexcatl. Right. However, in the uh, Occident, uh, I don't know, in Nayarit or Durango, they say, I speak Mexicano, right? Uh -huh. I am Nahua, but I speak Mexicano. So it's, it's interesting this part. And at the same time, uh, uh, I have um, learned a lot about my Nahuatl, Edward, right? And I have met uh, 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 Nahua speakers from uh, El Salvador, and it's good to know how the Nahuatl uh, is spoken in Latin America, but especially, um, um, I say the Nahuatl is 
is rich, is, is muy rico, and is very uh, strong, right? That's it. Thank you very much, Abelardo. Actually, I have another question for you. And this one is from a participant called Ever. And he writes a bit of, of the question or the comment in now also, <laughs> I'll try my best to read this. And then, uh, okay, so it says, Piali Tlamachti Quetl Abe Tlaskamati uh, and the rest, I honestly cannot read, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would love to hear about the novel recording and music and wonder what you hope to find and maybe explain the important connection between music, language, and culture. Oh, thank you, Ever. Uh, well, basically, I think the, uh, in Nahuatl we have, I think, several uh, genres of, of music, right? The, the first is the sacred music. Uh, second is the music for uh, uh, ceremonies, right? And third uh, is like uh, for, for parties, uh, uh, little little parties. Mm. Uh, to to me, to me, the the, the music ever is uh, super important. We have a strong connection with uh, uh, music from. Over uh, oh, my small town, right? And I think a couple of years ago we used music to to sing in Nahuatl, right? I think now uh, <laughs> the Spanish is is much more common when we uh, create music in Nahuatl, right? However, I think there are several resources about music in uh, I don't know if there are uh, archives about music ever. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but when I am in the United States, I like to hear music from my small town. That's it, Ever. Thanks again, Abelardo. And now I have a, a question for all of the, of, of the presenters. Uh, this is from Christopher Fletcher. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations. I'm struck at how important copists are to the history of all these documents. Yeah. Could you say a bit more in general about who these figures were and what their other responsibilities or interests were? Um, I'll start. I tried to find information on Botodini's copyists. And as far as I can tell, there really hasn't been done much done on it. Um, John Glass has some work, um, kind of just identifying different people's handwriting. Um, but I, I just had to work backwards by deducing like the scribes interest based on what they were copying. Um, and then I, I'm, I said in the chat earlier that um, the manuscript 1109, which Amber was talking about, it, it has the Alvech Lucio sheets, um, Sumaria Relacion and some other items. And it's so it's like a bound Samuel bond that has a lot of different stuff in it. And the main, the same person who wrote the Browning wrote some of the manuscripts in manuscript 1109. Um, so that's how John Glass decided that this person worked for Botudini, but we, we just don't know anything about, about them. And that is definitely something I want to do more research into, but I'm kind of, a uh, stuck like I'm not quite sure where to go next with it. It's such an interesting question and I think um, Heather is so well positioned to, to to speak to that issue and I would love to see you continue with this work. It's so interesting and potentially illuminating. Um, my my comments would be much more general in thinking about the copyists in service of projects and service of different kinds of historiographical projects. But um, what Heather's doing is really a deep dive into the work of the copyists themselves, and I think that's a a, a new angle that's potentially very very compelling. Thank you, Amber and Heather. Um, I have another question here for Abelardo from Catalina Ospina. Could you walk us through the translation of the Spanish entremés to Nahuatl? 
Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I will see my slides. Uh, of course. Uh, yes, I have. I have this part. Uh, or he, here is this this word uh, about like the translation uh, entre mes to nahuatl. Tewewetskiti <laughs> tepapachi, right? This this verb uh, is wets, wetska, or wetskitia, that is to cause uh, uh, laugh to someone. And tepapachi, tepapachi, this is, I think this is pachiwi, the, the verb, and that is like to be to be glad. Um, so entre mes is a, a technique uh, translation, but I don't know, in, in a simple translation, tewewetskiti uh, tepapachi is like uh, something that is good to laugh. Uh, como algo para reírse, right? Because this, uh, this uh, drama, right, between uh, Ilamaton y Juan Ishwiton is something uh, mm, to, to to laughing, right? Algo, algo para reír. And so I, I like this, this part because uh, in between Ilamaton and Ishwiton, the grandmother and, and Pierrot, Pierrot is a, is, is a, is a, is a bad, uh, is a bad boy or es muy travieso, right? And Ilama at the same time is, um, es una viejita, looks like he's pregnant. Entonces, eh, uh, they are in, Something, como, something to, to, to laughing. That's it. Thank you, Abelardo. Uh, let's see. Well, I guess um, I would like to um, give some minutes to the presenters uh, if you want to add something uh, to the conversation. Amber, Heather, Abelardo. I, I'll, I'll just say thank you both so much for your presentations. I, I really learned a lot and enjoyed both of them. Um, for Heather, I'll mention that um, I was working with these materials um, many moons ago at the same, at, during the same period that Susan Schroeder and her team were working on the Chimalpain text. Um, and in that wonderful reading room at the Newberry, uh, I was able to have conversations with her uh, and with Christian and David uh, about what they were working on and, and sort of thinking collaboratively about the, the Alba Isi social trans uh, transcriptions as well. Um, so hopefully soon we will all be able to return to that wonderful reading room and that wonderful collaborative and collective space. Um, it, is, it is just so productive. Um, and Abelardo, I, it was such a pleasure to hear about your work. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing your, your work develop and um, to, to, to see where you, you take these studies. Um, you're, you're in such a, a wonderful position to bring new light and new perspective to these materials. So thank you very much. Uh, well, um, uh, Amber, uh, Professor Amber, uh, it, it's a pleasure to talk with you and Heather and the audience. Uh, I, I work it a lot <laughs> when, when I was in my community, right? Uh, my community is very small, right? And in that, case, in that place, we don't have a lot of uh, like education, right? But I, uh, I don't know, my, my parents, they used to study it until the elementary school but they always transmit uh, to us like to go to the university. And I never thought when I will be in the university and when I will be doing my master degree to work with Nahuatl, right? So uh, in order to finish, a couple of years ago, uh, I met to John Sullivan in Mexico and he told me one day, Ave, uh, let's work together, right? So. I am now uh, here in, the, in Utah teaching Nahuatl and doing research, right? And now I am ABD, right, in, in the University of Albany, uh, uh, 
Heather knows about my studies. Uh, I think just my objective is uh, to do contributions, right, to the Nahuatl studies, right. Um, uh, Laro, would you mind sharing with us a bit about your, your current research? Yes, of course. Uh, well, basically, uh, I am at the uh, University of Albany in the Department of Anthropology. And uh, <laughs> when I was uh, finished my uh, bachelor degree in Mexico, uh, I was very interested in the religion of our communities, right? Uh, so uh, when, I, when I was studying my master's degree, I met the professor Luis Bucar. I think it was in Indianapolis in 2014. And well, uh, I, I was interested in, in her work. And so, and, 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 and she told me, Abe, if you want to study one day your PhD, you come to Albany, right? And so, uh, so now, uh, uh, I, I study the, basically the uh, one, one specialist ritual, one, one uh, speci uh, specialist prayer that we say in Espanol, rezanderos, uh, that are prayer specialists uh, that pray for, for people and pray for people who have passed away, right? So, uh, but at the same time, these, these people, Motio Chihuani, uh, uh, they were catechists and now they are prayer specialists, right? But at the same time, they uh, teach to Nahua people how to believe in the Catholicism, but he never forget the, our local beliefs, right? So I am interested uh, uh, to, to to know how was the Catholicism, how was the evangelization in our region there in Chicontepec, because there were the like the actors of this uh, evangelization, but interesting because they never forget the our local religion, right? Basically is that, uh, Laura. Thank you very much, Abelardo, and I wish you all the best in your in your research. And you know, it's really fascinating to hear what you're doing. And thank you very much to Amber and to Heather as well. I'm, you know, left wanting to ask you more about the scribes, but I'll leave it to some other moment because we're running out of time. And I'd like to um, pass it to Leah and the organizers to say some closing words for this wonderful symposium. Yeah, I just wanted to conclude and thank everybody for being here and for your wonderful presentations. We, uh, at the uh, several months ago, maybe a year ago or more, we asked everybody to really think about uh, bringing forth the indigenous voice from the documents. And I think that's come through in beautiful ways throughout the day. And um, really a lot of fascinating themes have emerged relating to um, intertextuality, copying, the role of scribes, um, the relationship between documents and different collections, um, the relationship between word and image, the role of the Creole scholar, uh, hemispheric projects, these are some key words that have come through, uh, and this really important idea of engaging with dispossession and preserving the pre-Hispanic past. So I hope that these videos that we've now recorded will be useful for teaching and for future scholars and that we can continue to learn from one another. And uh, I look forward to reading what emerges from all of your projects. And I hope we can keep in touch. Uh, with that, I will ask you all if, if you wanna get in touch with other scholars in the group. I know there's been an active chat and I think there's been an active chat, uh, you know, direct messaging too. I'm happy to connect scholars with one another via email. And I do hope we can all convene at the Newberry in the future to think more about these documents and other materials in the AIR collection. So thanks so much. Feel free to stay on for a few more minutes to ask more questions casually. And uh, thank you again to all the presenters and moderators. Thanks to you, Leah, and everybody at the Newberry.